Hey everybody, my name is Michael Yue and welcome to my talk at the Jamstack Conference 2021. So in this talk, I will talk to you about a new way to write serverless functions. So since this is a Jamstack, we're going to talk about the A in Jamstack, right? You know, so the A stands for API, and we understand it as microservices or serverless functions that serve uh, a, um, a static front end, right? That's what the A in Jamstack stands for. So how it started and how it's going? Well, the the API is not is not always uh, serverless functions, right? You know, in the past it could be um, a, a vertically integrated full stack application, so to speak. Right? You know, it could be um, years ago it was deployed on bare metal machines and then it become virtual machine. We're gonna talk about this later. And then with uh, the emergence of cloud native movement, um, there's more and more use of containers to run backend services, microservices, and that gives birth to uh, function as a service. And that's what we typically call um, serverless functions, right? You know, so for developers, uh, all you need to do is to write a function and then you upload it to, um, you know, to a service and uh, then and it become a microservice or it, or it becomes an API for you to use. However, in this evolution, uh, while it's conceptually we have moved to the serverless function phase, but um, in the implementation, we are still using containers, meaning that we are using, uh, underpinning those serverless functions are Docker containers um, or micro VMs. Um, and they have, well, let's say they have some issues. One of the primary issues is that serverless functions are slow and they're also heavy. So on the, um, you know, uh, on the graph on the left side, you know, the uh, we can see that's data from Datadog, but we can see that you know people half of Lambda functions runs less than 800 milliseconds, 0.8 seconds. You know, it's uh, uh, the graph was, um, you know, presented in a way to say that serverless functions are fast. But my initial reaction with this graph is, oh my God, serverless functions are so slow, right? You know, it's uh, um, 800 milliseconds. It's almost a second. You know, uh, consider that if you have a uh, if you have an application, uh, you have a Jamstack application that has that use maybe ten or twenty different microservices or APIs on the back end. You need to make those round trips, and this the the time can quickly add up. So, you know, eight hundred milliseconds or more. You know, half of the the, the lambda functions cost that more, and uh, and. To make things even worse, those are very simple functions. You know, when you say function as a service, people tend to write a function that's maybe 20 lines or 100 lines of JavaScript code or Python code and then deploy it. And uh, it takes, you know, almost a four seconds in order to in order to do that. And so that goes against one of the core tenets of Jamstack applications, right? When you have a um, when you have a static website, um, statically generated front end. And you can distribute it through um, through a CDN and other means. One of the key benefits it gives you is performance. But then the 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 functions as um, the serverless functions and the APIs at the back end so slow that sort of defeats the purpose, right? You know, so that's that's one thing. And perhaps an even bigger problem is the, the graph on the right is the startup time. As we can see, it's compared the startup time with different cloud providers with different language runtimes. And uh, with Azure, GCP, and uh, and uh, AWS, and uh, the time that's the time it takes for a serverless function to start, right? You know, so uh, the code start time. So when you have a uh, so when you have a serverless function, and uh, um, you call it from the front end, and how long does it take to um, for the for the back end to spin up a Docker instance or or Firecracker instance, and then uh, and then have a response, right? You know. And you can see even the fastest in, in AWS is measured in second in sub-seconds. You know, those are so it takes a, almost a second, or even in some instances, four or five seconds just to start up and then run for about half a second, you know, and then it's runs, you know, um runs 20 to 100 lines of code and then shut down. It's a very inefficient use of computing resources. So that's one of the uh, problems with serverless, right? So let's 
So how do we solve that? You know, that's, uh, um, as I discussed, one of the primary reasons for that is uh, is the use of Docker or uh, application containers or the VMs as, as a container for the, um, for the service functions. They are inherently slow. So if we look at history, things um, has happened, you know, a history doesn't repeat itself, but often rhymes. In the past 20 years, we have seen again and again um, the migration from uh, uh, the front-end technology migrate from to the back-end. I think Jamstack is also one of the um, is one of those mega trends. You know, is that uh, developers on the front end find better ways to do things and then move it to the back end, right? So in the 1990, in almost 20 years ago, we started with Java. Java started as applet in the in the browser, if you remember. You know, and then, but then it soon turns out the people don't really want to play games, Java games in the browser. They want to use Java on the server because it provides managed code, because it provides memory safety, portability, and all that nice features on the back end. So Java now today is a predominantly um, a language for the, for the back end. And then 10 years later in 2009, JavaScript made similar migration. You know, JavaScript started as a, and it still is, uh, primary uh, programming language in the browser, and in, and then Node.js come along, and uh, then JavaScript becomes one of the dominant programming languages on the, on the back end as well. And a lot of new applications are started with JavaScript, and including you know um, an, a Netlify functions and universal functions and you know, things things of that nature. They also support JavaScript functions. And then fast forward to 2020, we have we encountered this uh, problem. We are in the in the era of um, cloud native and microservices and serverless functions, as I just said, so we need we are searching for a new runtime. That's that's because when you run Java and Java and JavaScript, you still need Docker. You still need uh, operating system level container to uh, to provide security and to provide a sandbox for them. Can we have a lightweight sandbox that's that is um, has all those nice features like? Provide architecture decoupling from business logic and infrastructure logic. It's portable. It support multiple programming languages. Provide security. Provide, uh, allow people to do no ops. You know that's essentially the, the serverless idea. And one of the leading candidates for that, and also you know um, coming from where I come from, you know that's uh, um, we think uh, WebAssembly could be um, the the new runtime for the cloud native or for the Jamstack applications. So that's um, that may be a new idea for a lot of people in this audience, right? Could uh, WebAssembly really become a dark Docker alternative? Isn't that something that's primary runs in the browser, right? You know, if you look at those um, uh, those technologies, they have a lot of similarities. And WebAssembly and Docker both provide runtime isolation. You know, they um, um, it's, it's just happen at different levels as we soon discuss. And they provide portability. WebAssembly we would argue provide far better portability than Docker because it really doesn't depend on the underlying because it's a bytecode format. It doesn't depend on the underlying CPU architecture, and it's provide ease of deployment. You know you can package everything together and just copy over a file, and it's um, and you can hot deploy, and you know do do things that normally you know ops people would do, right? You know so that's so that is very fitting for the serverless paradigm. And uh, yet, um, WebAssembly is much faster and lighter than Docker. You know, um, this is a paper we published uh, earlier this year in IEEE Software. You know, it's a peer-reviewed, um, you know, computer journal, and we compared, um, you know, our WebAssembly runtime as we will discuss later. So it's called Watson Edge, and uh, uh, against the Docker, and uh, um, uh, the 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 yellow bar is or the orange bar is uh, Docker plus native application, meaning a C. C++ application compiled and then run on Docker. And then the green bar is Docker on Node.js, the same logic implemented in Node.js and running inside Docker, right? And the um, blue bar is WebAssembly and the, the project used to call it SSVM and now we call it Wasm Edge, right? You know, so um, if you look at this um, a figure at startup time, it's 100 times faster than, um, than Docker and uh, at runtime, it's also faster. In, the, in its core, WebAssembly is more abstract than Docker. So, you know, um, I think this is um, summarized very well by, you know, by other people. I would just repeat it here, right? You know, so there are three way, three levels of um, uh, um, runtime or container abstraction. 
The first layer is uh, the VM, and it essentially simulates a computer with all the overhead the computer has. And the second layer, which we, which is what where we are in the industry right now, is application containers, that are Docker, Container D, and the CRIO, and you know things like that. They simulate a private OS, right? You know that's uh, um, which is significantly faster than just to say simulate uh, uh, a VM, uh, a computer. But it also comes with the overhead of the OS, right? You know, that's you need the libraries and you need to simulate the network, the file system, and all that. And high-level language VMs, starting from JVM all those years ago, and WebAssembly today simulate a process. It's a much lighter and much uh, it's it's a much lighter approach. It allows things to run much faster, start up much faster, and run much faster. However, that also creates uh, a issue, you know, because there's no free lunch, right? That goes to the um, core of this talk today. You know, is that um, by simulating a process, you no longer have an operating system. So you don't have all those developer ne necessities that, for, that Docker affords you. So Docker starts the operating system. You can run whatever language frameworks that you want in there. But WebAssembly re requires compiled bytecode. You need to use, um, um, you know, a, a compiler and then use the SDKs. It's think of like Java, you know, you need the, the, the programming language, the compiler, and then the, the runtime libraries and all those things in order to build the application that runs on it. In exchange, it gives you security, portability, and very fast performance. But the developer experience is not as good as, say, just running Python or, or Node.js in Docker. So how do we solve that? Well, so that's... Um, the title of the talk is low code in DSL, right? You know, so low code improves WebAssembly developer experience. That's the thing that I want to argue here. And the runtime we're going to use is, um, is um, like I just said, it's Watson Edge. It's a popular WebAssembly runtime optimized for high performance applications. This is also my project. It's a it's a project hosted by the CNCF. It's the only WebAssembly runtime project hosted by CNCF. There's many use cases. For, um, for for using WebAssembly in the cloud native environments that goes beyond the serverless functions. And if you are interested, you can look up those. You, know, you can go to our GitHub repository and look it up. And you know, I I wouldn't spend too much time here. So I want to focus on two things that made um, you know that we have done to make programming on WebAssembly a lot easier. You know, because traditionally WebAssembly requires you to use languages like Rust or C++. Or at simplest, you know, Swift and Kotlin, you know, in order to write, um, those are all compile time languages, you know, you, you can't, you, not really dynamic languages like JavaScript. But for front end developers, especially Jamstack developers, we look for, well, we, we look for JavaScript. You know, we want to write to the front end and the back end, or in JavaScript, that's JavaScript has become the low code solution for, um, for, for Jamstack application developers. So the ability to run JavaScript on Wasm is, becomes important. And at this point, some people may ask, you know, why do you run JavaScript on Wasm? Don't we have JavaScript own virtual machine like, like uh, Node.js and like V8 and you know things like that? Yes, there's V8, but in order for V8 to, uh, but you don't typically use V8 by itself, do you? You don't even use Node.js by itself. You typically, when you, during deployment, you typically deploy Node.js inside Docker, right? So for us, it's to run JavaScript directly in, in a container like WebAssembly. In that case, you don't need Docker and you don't need V8, just WebAssembly, right? So if the, uh, the project in particular is, um, is, um, is this, um, you know, it's called WebAssembly QuickJS. And what we did is to compile QuickJS into a WebAssembly application and use that as a fa very fast JavaScript interpreter. And uh, the, the, let me go to the next slide. And the real benefit is that it allows JavaScript, uh, it allows WebAssembly APIs and even C-based native shared library APIs to be exposed as JavaScript APIs in WebAssembly. So that allows us to do things like TensorFlow, TensorFlow inference on the, on the GPU in, in native performance uh, using JavaScript on the, uh, and safely and securely on the WebAssembly runtime. So we have a lot of examples in our GitHub repository, and so I would not repeat here. And if you're interested, you can go there and have a look. Oh, so here is an example. Yeah, so you know, so here we have 33 lines of JavaScript, and what it does is that it reads in a TensorFlow model and reads in a picture, 
and then it does uh, the AI inference and interprets the the tensor the the model outputs and then what it does is a uh, it's an image net model so it, so it goes on and uh, and and, and recognizes what's the image and uh, give a give a natural language label for that right you know so for all this is is with all this fluff and you know different um, you know going through the tensor and all that um, it's certain lines of JavaScript code. And what it does is that it's it runs super fast. It runs in a couple of milliseconds. You know that's uh, um, you know runs far more faster than say TensorFlow.js and you know things like that because WebAssembly have a new sandbox model that allows the the Java the QuickJS interpreter to go directly to the TensorFlow native library and the GPU to execute this logic. So we have this. Uh, we have this example in our GitHub repository. You can go there and run it yourself and see it for yourself. Now, is it too slow? You know, is that running JavaScript inside WebAssembly too slow? Although it improves developer experience, right? You know, is it too slow? But it's well, we it has to. The answer is what do you compare it to, right? You know, it's much faster than Node.js plus Ubuntu plus Docker, the the traditional stack. Now we only have WebAssembly and QuickJS. It's also much faster than V8 for native functions like TensorFlow. So to implement TensorFlow on V8 is, uh, you know, you are looking at, you know, one or two seconds, right? It's not slower than the V8 interpreter, but much lighter. You know, it's like two percent of the size of the V8 interpreter. It allows it to run in edge clouds. That's, um, you know, that that requires much small, smaller footprint per, per serverless function, right? And then again, you know, there's uh, if you if you pay attention to the to the internet, you know, it's, uh, uh, V8 is primarily fast because of the just-in-time compiler. But there's lots of security issues with just-in-time compiler, so they are recommending to turn off GIT at, um, for 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 security critical applications anyway. So you know, so the, so the argument I want to make is no, it's not too slow. But we can take this step one step further because now we talk about JavaScript. Can we do true DSL, domain-specific language, on on, on Wasm? There's many ways, there are several ways to do that. First, that you can invent a domain specific language and do a compile and create a compiler and compile it to Wasm bytecode. Just remember, Wasm is polyglot, so meaning that it can support many different languages on the front end. It's already supported many different languages on the front end, from Rust to C, Swift, Kotlin, like I just said, right? And you could have a DSL that's specifically for your purpose. That's um, actually, this is a lot, a lot of uh, several blockchain projects that's taken. You know, they are mostly financial applications or decentralized applications, and they have invented their own language to be compiled into WebAssembly and it runs on those blockchains. And then there's the second way is really easy Rust. You know, is that to make a Rust an easier language by using the the microsystem in Rust, which you know there's a lot of talk about that. You know, that's I wouldn't go into details. But then the third is perhaps the most straightforward is to customize a DSL can be interpreted by, by WebAssembly program, like we just did with QuickJS and JavaScript, right? We have a JavaScript interpreter that built into um, build as a WebAssembly application. So to this end, we build a demo application that you can also find out on our GitHub, which is basically a YAML application that repeats the logic, the, the JavaScript application you have just seen. And it tells you where to find the model. Where to find the picture? Where then you know what's uh, uh, what's the input, what's the input um, uh, tensor and what's the output tensor and how where do you find the label from the from the output tensor? And all you do is compile this um, and uh, you know in in this uh, in the WebAssembly application you read this YAML and read a picture and then that's then that's it. You know it's a, it's a, it's it's done in a way that's domain specific that's specific for TensorFlow inference, right? So I think my time is almost up. I'm at um, 19 minutes already. And uh, um, so um, again, uh, thank you for your interest in my talk. And if you're interested in learning more about all this, you know, uh, WebAssembly, JavaScript on WebAssembly, DSL on WebAssembly and all that, and how, the, how they relate to service functions and how they how they are run in, net, uh, in, in the Netlify and our cell infrastructure, you can go to our GitHub at wasmh slash wasmh. Um, you know, it's a very active community. You know, that's uh, ask a question in the issues, um, send your PR, and uh, you know, that's um, um, I look forward to discuss to discuss this with you guys. Thank you very much. Sit, Jamstack. Sit. Woof woof. Good boy.